अथ मंडुक्योपनिषत शाति पाठ भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा नमस्ते वेलकम टू द फर्स्ट एपिसोड द इंट्रोडक्टरी वीडियो to the Manduki Upanishad. Now, if you've been around here for a while, you might say, well, didn't you do Manduki Upanishad already? And, well, we did, but it was kind of a surface-level overview. I mean, the subject matter is so deep, and we didn't really want to go into it because at the time we had not established a foundation. But in the process of going through the Kata Upanishad, that foundation has been established. So now I feel comfortable about going into it and going deep because Mandukya Upanishad is something unique and special. In all the Vedic literature, it's the only one that doesn't use stories and anecdotes or depend on any other literature. It stands alone because Beginning from Aum and the meaning of Aum in terms of consciousness, it derives all the truths of Vedanta by reason. So rather than me talk spontaneously about it, I've prepared a little introduction and then I'm going to make comments on it. So this will give you all the information you need to understand why Mandukya Upanishad is very much worthwhile studying. What is truth, especially ultimate truth? How is it found, tested, and validated? Most people cannot realize the transcendental ultimate truth beyond all categories of time, space, and causation. Yet everyone, even a fool, thinks that what he knows is the truth. Every follower of every religion thinks that his faith, his scripture, or his interpretation of it reveals the highest truth. Self-interested promoters of sectarian cults, both sacred and secular, focus their followers on points of difference rather than those of agreement. Thus, the world is thrown into conflict and confusion. The world is in a conflict. The world is in a crisis. I mean, it's in multiple crises. But the root of them all is the crisis of truth and meaning. Without truth, we cannot establish the meaning of human existence. And the problem is today, there are so many people claiming to have the truth. But if you examine their truths, they're all partial. They're all exclusive, not inclusive. But the real character of ultimate truth or absolute truth is that it includes everything. It explains everything. It makes everything approachable and makes all problems solvable. Even the problem of suffering of birth and death in the material world. So, Mandukya Upanishad is such a truth, but one has to expend a bit of effort to really understand it. How to search for the ultimate truth? Most people try to use reason and philosophy. But if, after thousands of years of so-called philosophy, a rational ultimate truth common to all minds, has not been discovered. It is not true philosophical inquiry, but futile speculation. The most ancient solution to the problem of ultimate truth is found in the Vedanta. The time-proven, reliable method of Vedanta to arrive at reality is called vichara, inquiry or investigation. So what's the problem with philosophy? It never comes to any conclusion. If you had a real philosophy, one that embraces everything and explains everything, 
then you would be able to study it, close the book, and go out and solve all your problems. But here we are, thousands of years of history, of philosophy, and there's no solution in sight. That's because all these philosophies get wrong the nature of the human being itself, which is consciousness. And that's the advantage of Vedanta. Vedanta is a system of truth, inquiry into truth, and then putting that truth into practice as yoga. And so we're going to be studying Vedanta, but not from the point of view of authority, from the point of view of logic and reason, so that you can think through it yourself and come to the right conclusions. The purpose of Vedanta Vichara is discovering a universal absolute truth, free from all dispute and unopposed to any school of thought, religion, or interpretation of scriptures. Like gravity, its truth must be realizable and verifiable by all, independent of sect, creed, color, race, sex, or belief. And it aims at the greatest good, permanent cessation of suffering for all beings equally. Now, Vedanta Vichara is different from other types of investigation or research because it aims to find the ultimate truth, that truth which is applied to everything and everyone. I use the example of gravity because everyone and everything is affected by it. And in the same way, everyone and everything is affected by consciousness. Consciousness is the common denominator that we all have. And this is what brings us together. If we can solve the problem of consciousness, why it comes from, why it exists, what it's all about, then we can solve every other problem in the world because they're all ancillary to consciousness. The Upanishads are Vedic literatures that help us realize this truth by means of a symbol. The symbol used by the Mandukya Upanishad and others is Aum, the word of all words. Mandukya Upanishad explains the calculus of consciousness starting from Aum, the symbol of non-dual Brahman and its expression as four states of consciousness. From there, it derives the rational core of highest Vedic philosophy by reason alone. The equivalent in physics would be to derive all of thermodynamics, relativity, and quantum mechanics from Newton's basic equations of motion. The science of consciousness, as given in Vedanta, is a form of calculus. What do I mean by a calculus? A way of calculating things, a way of thinking about things that comes to applicable solutions practical solutions, things that you can use to help your everyday life. And I compare the system of reasoning in Mandukya Upanishad to deriving relativity and quantum mechanics from Newton's equations of motion, which, if you know anything about it, is like taking a, a tricycle and turning it into a Mercedes. <laughs> but it can be done. Actually, I've seen it done by a high school physics teacher. So if that is possible, it's also possible to understand consciousness simply from the meaning of Aum and expand that until it solves even the most intractable philosophical and existential problems. Mandukya Upanishad like Mundaka, Prashna, and some minor Upanishads, is excerpted from the Atharva Veda. It is one of the shortest of the principal Upanishads. Muktika Upanishad declares that if one cannot study all 108 plus Upanishads, that if one reads the Mandukya alone, it will deliver Mukti, liberation from rebirth and suffering. 
By liberation, Mandukya Upanishad does not mean promises of future paradise, but experiential, existential freedom from ignorance and suffering here and now. So Mandukya Upanishad is very short. It's only 12 verses. And the whole first chapter of this karika simply contains those verses and commentaries on them by Gaudapada and Shankaracharya. But these 12 verses are very profound, very deep and powerful in their meaning because they penetrate to the essence of what it is to exist, what it is to be, and what it is to be conscious. So the importance of this is that this is the key to solving the problem of birth and death. We're all thrown into this world, into a situation that we don't choose, and yet we have to choose and act and will be held accountable for the results through the law of karma. So, of course, the situation we're thrown into is actually dependent on our previous lives' activities, but since we don't remember those, we don't feel responsible for them. We don't feel like we own them. And we think, oh, life is unfair. I was thrown into this situation against my will, and so on and so on. Well, we have to get over that and come to the positive point of view of we can solve these problems. And Mundaku Upanishad gives us the tools to solve them. Gaudapada has written 215 profound verses known as the Karika to explain the Upanishad. And his grand disciple, Sripad Shankaracharya, has written a commentary on both the Upanishad and the Karika. Gaudapada's Karika is divided into four chapters, prakaranas or treatises. Agama, scripture, on consciousness, Vaitatya, on the illusoriness of sensory experience, Advaita, on non-duality, and Alata Shanti, quenching the firebrand, on causality. So, besides the twelve verses of the Upanishad itself, Gaudapad has written 215 verses divided into four chapters. Each one is a prakarna, which is a specific type of essay, Sanskrit essay, with uh, certain rules and peculiarities of the Sanskrit language, which we'll get into as we go into the book. Each one of these essays is on a specific topic, and by the end of the book, it has reconstructed all the knowledge needed for complete realization of Brahman, and complete self-realization. The first chapter of the Kartika deals with the question of reality from the Vedic understanding of consciousness. But it does not rest content with interpreting Vedic authority. The three subsequent chapters demonstrate the same truths found in the scriptures by means of reason alone. Like Brahman itself, Gaudapada's Mandukya Upanishad Karika stands independently, without support from any scriptural or doctrinal tradition. That is because it reveals the natural laws of existence, consciousness, and causality that apply to every creature in the universe. When I was in high school, I studied physics. And the reason I chose physics rather than chemistry or some other field of science, is that it's completely mathematical. If you know the basic equations of physics, mathematically you can derive everything else. So it's very beautiful. It's not like chemistry that requires tons of memorization or biology or geology. <laughs> you have to memorize so many things. But in physics, if you forget something, well, you can simply derive it. This is very beautiful. And similarly, from the starting point of Aum, Mandukya Upanishad logically, mathematically derives 
all the knowledge of Vedanta, all the conclusions of the Vedas that stand alone without any reference to any authority. And this is a wonderful thing because, of course, today people don't trust authority for good reason. Vedic authority is different, but still, Vedic authority can be misinterpreted. So if you can think through yourself and derive all these conclusions independently, you don't need the scriptures anymore. And you can realize all this knowledge yourself. Mandukya Upanishad follows the Vedantic method of vichara by investigating and elucidating the nature of consciousness, developing it further by profound reason and irrefutable logic. According to the Karika, the three fundamental problems of philosophy are the nature of the external material and the internal mental worlds, the nature and origin of consciousness, and the meaning of causality. So each of the chapters, after the first chapter, is written to solve a specific problem. And it does that by means of reason and logic. Thinking through the problem from the beginning to the end. And here, the end means realization or application of the knowledge that we derive by our reason. So this is a very important and unique thing because reason and logic are the things that make humans unique among all the creatures on this planet. If we can use reason and logic correctly, we can solve all the problems before us. And of course, the problem is most people don't use it correctly. <laughs> They're biased. They have some solution in view before they even start. And they use reason and logic to justify their bias. That's not correct vichara. Vi correct vichara has no bias, no prejudice, no conclusion determined in advance. It simply takes the evidence and thinks about it until it can be realized directly. The unique feature of Mandukya is that while other Upanishads deal with the several aspects of Vedanta, such as religion, theology, scholasticism, mysticism, scientific method, and metaphysics, Mandukya deals exclusively with philosophy and ontology, exactly as understood by the best contemporary thinkers. The Karika treats the world, consciousness, and causality in separate chapters, it is pure philosophy. It does not need any anecdotes or imaginary conversations. It is also silent about rules and regulations, religious rituals, and sacrifices. So Mandukya Upanishad is not going to tell us any stories. It doesn't have any imaginary conversations that set up a context for a specific type of discussion. But what it does is thinks through all the problems until they reach solution. That means it's not concerned with religious rules and regulations or organizations or different scriptures, what is stated by certain authorities in the past. Huh? It doesn't get entangled with any of that. It is pure philosophy, pure absolute truth. Gotapada is the first philosopher giving rational explanation of Advaita Vedanta, the objective of the Upanishadic teachings. The method of vichara adopted by Mandukya Upanishad and followed by Gotapada for revealing reality is a phenomenological observation and analysis of everyday human experience based on consciousness. Gotapada accepts all knowledge and experience. Unlike conventional philosophers, he welcomes and accepts even the views of his opponents as component parts of the complete knowledge leading to the ascertainment of relative truth and realization of ultimate truth. So Gaudapad, Shankaracharya's guru's guru, was the first philosopher 
to give a rational explanation of Vedanta, not depending on previous authorities. And the value of this is that it can be applied to everyday experience. So you don't require a temple, you don't require an ashram, you don't require an elaborate lifestyle based on chanting and rituals and all these rules and stuff. You can be in the midst of any situation in life and use this knowledge to solve the problems before you. If a philosophical system is going to be considered a final solution to the problems of life, it has to cover all human experience, not just what happens in a temple or an ashram or people when, when they meditate or something like that. But it has to be applicable to, you know, taking out the garbage <laughs> and other situations that may not be so ideal. It has to include everything, including its own opposites, including, for example, the philosophical opponents that try to attack and tear down Shankaracharya's and Gotapad's philosophy. It has to include all of that and not reject any of it, or it's a partial solution. It's not a complete solution. So it has to include even the aspects of life that we don't normally think about, such as dreaming and deep sleep. Gaudapada's unique excellence is emphasizing the impossibility of reaching the ultimate truth unless the totality of human experience and knowledge is taken into consideration. Other philosophers generally build systems on the waking state alone, but the philosophers of the Upanishads hold that unless all states of consciousness Waking, dream, deep sleep, and Turiya, the fourth state of illumination, are coordinated, there cannot be adequate data for successful inquiry into ultimate truth. Not only dreaming and deep sleep, also Turiya, enlightenment, illumination, self-realization, all these states plus the ordinary mundane states, various different qualities of material nature and human nature, all have to be included in this knowledge, and all have to be accounted for, and all have to be understood in such a way that one can use this system to solve all the problems of life. Philosophical inquiry based on waking consciousness and logical jugglery alone can never reach final conclusions. Hence, Mandukya Upanishad begins with a detailed analysis of the properties of all four states of consciousness. It proceeds to derive the highest ultimate truth, Advaita Vedanta, from that analysis by reason alone. This transcendental calculus of consciousness is the epitome of good logic, for it confirms and validates the truths of the Vedas without resorting to limited sectarian authoritarian interpretations. So it's very easy if you're having a discussion with someone, and especially if you're trying to prove a certain point, uh, you should do this or you should think like this and they're resisting it. It's very easy to simply say, well, it says so in this book, or it says so uh, somebody who's very powerful or well-known or authoritative said so. That's why. <laughs> That's not enough for a keen intelligence. Someone with real intelligence is going to say, but why is it like that? Why are you telling me to accept this book or this teacher or whatever. Why are you giving me this instruction? And why do you think you have any authority to tell me what to do or think? This is a fact. As human beings, we all have independence, individuality, free will, and so on. We are able to think for ourselves. And a real teaching, a real teacher, an authentic solution to the problems of life is not going to include any authoritative statements like you must do this, or you have to do that, or you must not do this and that and the other thing. 
Rather, it's going to give you a view on life that is so powerful that you can solve all these problems by yourself, on your own, simply by thinking it through. Yes, this does require learning a certain amount of information. But that information will give you the power to apply it to any situation and come out with a solution that works not only for you, but for everyone. And this is the great power, this is the great value of the Upanishads in general, and specifically Mandukya Upanishad, that it gives the transcendental calculus of consciousness that enables anyone, starting with their direct everyday experience in life, to come to the conclusions that lead to complete liberation, complete cessation of all suffering. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.